It'll take them just a second to log in. Good evening, everybody. Um, as you're logging in tonight, your cameras and microphones have been set to remain off. I just wanted to make sure you guys knew. So if you could keep them off, that'd be great. It kind of cuts down on the Zoom lag um, so that the event runs smoother, which is good for all of us. All right, I think everybody's pretty much connected here. I see a couple more still trying to connect. Um, all right, well, welcome. As I said, I'm Carrie and I'm on the Anderson's events team. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you to our event with Renee Erickson in conversation with Sarah Gruenberg. Thank you all for being here tonight. The Anderson's family has been selling books independently since 1875, believe it or not. Yeah. And uh, we've made it through some really tough times before and we're gonna make it through this tough time as well. Uh, but we just wanna let you know that your support of this event by attending tonight and of course your purchase of the book through us allows us to remain in business. And we are truly grateful for your support during this just insane time. Uh, I'm getting a couple more in the waiting room. I let them in. Ah. Uh, all right, uh, a couple things about tonight before we get started. Uh, as mentioned previously, your cameras and microphones are off for the duration of the event, so please keep them off. If you'd like to ask questions, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so please submit questions at any time during the presentation or during the, the author's speaking um, through the chat feature here on Zoom. And I will be collecting them and then I'll hop back on at the end and ask them on your behalf. Um, I'm gonna tell you guys for some reason here in the virtual, uh, events landscape. People are very shy. Um, and I just want to beg you to please ask questions because it really just makes for a, a much more fun and just interactive event for you and for the authors. So just go ahead and like I said, at any point during um, the talk, if you just want to go ahead and throw one of those in the chat to me, I'll be collecting them for the end. Um, if you, oh, one more thing, if you ordered a book for tonight and remember all the books tonight are signed, um, know that you'll receive an email when your books are either ready to pick up if that's the option you chose in Naperville, or if you want to have them shipped to you. But I just want to let you know that, um, sometimes that takes a day or two to get that notification because we have actual human beings who process those orders, no machines. Um, so it might just be a day or two. So just keep an eye out for that. If you haven't ordered a book for tonight or you would like addi additional signed copies, and I'm really just going to remind you again that signed copies make amazing gifts, um, I'll be putting info on how to order more in the chat uh, during the event. Okay, but now on to the good stuff, why we're all really here. Um, I'm, we're here tonight, of course, to welcome Renee Erickson, who is the James Beard award-winning chef and co-owner of numerous Seattle restaurants, including the Walrus and the Carpenter, the Whale Winds, and the Narwhal Oyster Truck. Uh, she is the author of A Boat, A Whale, and a Walrus, Menus and Stories, and of course, we're here tonight to hear all about her beautiful new book, Getaways. She will be in conversation with Sarah Gruenberg, who is an American chef, who is a head chef and owner at Monteverde Restaurant and past, I'm going to mess this up, the name. It's okay. <laughs> past, 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 close enough. In Chicago, right here in Chicago, yay. Um, while executive chef at Spiaria, she held a Michelin star for three years. In 2017, she was named the 2017 Best Chefs in the Great Lakes at the James Beard Foundation Awards. Um, so we are among very good foodie company tonight. And with no further ado, I'm just going to welcome both of you ladies. Thank you again so much for coming. And I am going to disappear for a little bit, but I'm here if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you. Very Hello. fun. No. Hey, hi. Hey. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, hi, everyone. It's like kind of like we want to see you guys. But we know we can't for the first <laughs> few minutes. Um, so just a quick story about how Renee and I met. We were at, uh, we did the James Beard Chef Boot Camp together and became good friends. And I had always, you know, just loved everything she does and her food. And when she told me about this book, I just died. And I thought it was so beautiful. And when I got the copy, I was so excited. So Renee, I know I've told you this, but it is absolutely gorgeous. Thank and you. it makes me so happy to have this as my <laughs> day off reading. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess tell us all a little bit about what sparked this idea of a book. It's so different um, thinking about taking a sense of place and making it the highlight, which I know a lot of us cook that way. We think about a sense of place and 
and um, the map and then visiting and traveling and what made you kind of think about this idea for a book? Um, well, so like, as you're experiencing now, books take forever to write. So this was an yes. idea that was from, started in 2018. Um, I had written a book um, almost eight years ago now, I think, and um, didn't want to do another one for a while because it's just so much work. Uh, but um, I, I, in the course of the last seven years, um, met a woman who's my agent now, who's amazing. And she um, I did, does her job very well, where she's super pushy and pes pesters me to think about things a lot, which was great. And um, we would talk weekly kind of about ideas around books and, and, and you know, how, what I would be interested in, in doing because, because it's so much work, like, I think it's something that you really have to want to give the effort to because it's, you know, on top of like, as you know, Sarah, like running a restaurant and cooking and um, even pre pandemic, it was daunting to imagine doing it. So um, we started talking about just kind of my life around food and in relationship to the restaurants and the um, conversation kept landing back in Rome when I was a student there. I was, I have an art degree. I went to University of Washington and I have a printmaking and painting degree and ended up in Rome my last year. Um, and wow, and, that's amazing. Yeah, it, you know, for sure. I wish I could live in Rome. <laughs> I, I look every day for her apartments. I'm like, okay, what's yeah. that? <laughs> Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so I, um, you know, we started, you know, kind of thinking about that in regards to like my culinary education, which is basically travel and eating um, and how that has progressed over the last 25 years in, in my um, love of, of places in the world. And so the chapters, there's six chapters in the book. There's Rome, yes. um, Paris, uh, Normandy, London, Baja, and Seattle. And Seattle just was at the end because it's, you know, where I'll always be in my life. But um, those are in the order, excuse me, the order that um, I have kind of traveled creatively, you know, as a, as a cook. I mean, obviously as a tourist too, but um, I spent a lot of time right. in Rome, obviously when I was a student. And then um, when I was 25, I bought Boat Street and the Susan Kaplan who um, started Boat Street, she, her family was um, from France and um, New England. And so the food was really French focused. Um, and so I started shutting the restaurant down for two weeks because it was the only way to have time off and travel. And, and that kind sure. of spun out into the other places. So from, you know, from Paris at, um, I started thinking about opening Walrus and the Carpenter. And um, so then I wanted to go eat oysters in Normandy and so on. So the chapters yes. are places that I've been to many, many times and um, also have created really great connections with friends. And so it becomes, um, you know, more than, uh, you know, checking the-, the It's kind of like your places. culinary yearbook a little bit. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> you know, like- It's funny, the first book, Boda Whale and the Walrus, um, I didn't think about it in the same way prior to this book being published. Um, but like, I think it makes a lot of sense to make the connection that, you know, the first book was really kind of focusing on those people that really meant a lot to me um, here in Seattle um, and in the Pacific Northwest. And then this is kind of the broader circle. So kind of going out to the people that I've met and have um, learned a lot from over the years in these other locations. So, yeah. That's a absolutely it's I mean I know that you you probably worked on this pre pandemic but how, what crazy timing to create a book about travel and and let all of us dream through the pages yeah. of one day getting back and and experiencing these places for our own but to have the recipes now to make them in your own kitchen is amazing yeah, it, it, I feel very fortunate. That was um, certainly not orchestrated on my end. We um, did all the travel for the book in 2019. So we were in um, wow. Mexico in early January. And then in March, um, myself and Sarah, who wrote the book with me, and then Jim, my photographer, um, we were all in Europe for almost not quite, um, not quite three, well, three and a half weeks, essentially. So it was, 
um it was really fun it was um way too much food and, and wine and all those things um crammed into that but um i think you know to write a book about places you know you have to go there to really right capture. and i i really wanted it to be um you know through my eyes versus through um like what people expect to find in those places so i mean there's obviously a lot of um you know images and things that obviously there's you know the first big spread is of of the pantheon which is you know yeah. my favorite building on the planet um so beautiful it's insane i love it so much but um yeah i think that the, the the working on it prior to the shutdown thankfully was mostly complete we had um basically editing and, and then we did a lot of the design work this last year but even that was really strange because right. it was um you know it's all virtual so like we're looking at everything yes. on the computer and normally we would get um oh, there it is, there it okay, is. Beyond. yeah gorgeous my favorite so jeffrey mitchell who did the illustration for my first book also is the, he does a lot of illustrations here and yes when we were talking about it um my crow's back sarah just so you know yeah. i love you have to tell everybody about this crow so she's on the top of the roof oh yeah she's watching I have so a pet crow. crow. <laughs> we don't know if she's a she, but we changed. She, she, I think she's a she. So her name's Jackie and she's been fed all year long by me, which I think is maybe something I'm not supposed to do, but she's just so sweet. So she comes in the morning and then she'll come in the afternoon if I'm around and she'll go on walks with me and my dog. And yeah, it's a little absurd, but and she only has one her. leg. And she has one and leg. So that's how that's I always do with her because <laughs> they all look really similar. There she goes. Well, um, that's the beauty of being in Seattle, which you're in your backyard now. So that yeah. probably has a lot of inspiration for you also, book and cooking and your pizza oven in, in the backyard. Yeah, I know. Um, it's hard to, I think, you know, I don't know how it's working for you with your book, but it's hard to edit. Like there's so many things that you want to, like there's so many recipes you want to share and ideas and places and images and, um, yeah, so I think the the editing of a book is pretty challenging. So especially in regards to like a chapter that or a book that's six chapters of six different places. Yeah. Um, it was you know like I think it could be done like five more times or you know forever essentially because you're just always sure. going to discover new stuff. But well, that's what I loved. It really struck me that the mm -hmm. photography you took actually at the restaurants that you yeah. were at. And how was that? Like, did the Italians and the, the Parisians, they were down with it? Or were they a little like, they were you know, surprised. They probably didn't care. They were like, it's fine. I mean, I think the ones that we, you know, obviously not every place that I talk about is photographed, but we sent, I sent a lot of emails. Um, London in particular, that was probably the um, easiest. I mean, language barrier, obviously not a problem, but um, we, um, and I had been in, I'm trying to think, I think I'd been to pretty much every location sometime within the previous year as well during the writing of it. So mm -hmm. um, they were places that like I had been, you know, they weren't just like, oh, I'm going to go in and see if I like it and put it in the book. They're places that had made an impact and I'd gone back to over and over again. Um, Armando, like we were talking about, Armando El Pantheon, which is this beautiful restaurant that's in a place that nothing... Yeah that good should be um, because it's right next to the Pantheon and um, you know Italians are usually they take pictures of food like if you're in Italy and you go up to the restaurant and they have a menu with photos oh my god like, yeah. don't eat there like that is the number one first lesson or if there's like somebody heckling you from the front gate yeah, or the right. front patio come eat we have the best italian food like don't go to the restaurants either you need to go to the one that like acts like they don't have tables Absolutely. or they're like i don't think so you can't come in sure. and you have to try a few times right they um it's a it's like you know i i i've been many many times and i'm always like charmed and and in love with it and i think the menu is super simple um or limited it's not simple but um they um they definitely focus on what they can do the best that yeah it's super seasonal here's which is the greatest hits that's the italian thing that i think is so 
um, fabulous. Someone asked about drinks, but I'm gonna, I think I always forget the actual like super details, but I believe it's six cocktails and like 20 um, food recipes per chapter. And the cocktails are, are um, I'm not a bartender at all. Um, and so they're, they're cocktails that I think anyone at home could make. There's a few that are a little bit fancier, like there's a gin fizz that takes a little more technique, but um, in general, it's really um, approachable. I think the only challenge, the bigger challenge would be like ingredient sourcing. So like finding interesting um, vermouths and amaros and things like that. But now with the internet, you can pretty much buy anything anywhere. So. Um, and I love that these, all these things that you've highlighted about each place and the drinks to go to, like those are the drinks you should order when you go to these places. And they're gonna know that you, as the guests have like an understanding of what they do best. Not like, you know, how many times did I, first time I go to Italy and people are like, where's the McDonald's? And I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Don't be the American going to the McDonald's in Rome or, you know, <laughs> drink a drink that's from that place. If, um, <clears throat> absolutely. The cocktails look beautiful. And what I love about this book too is with the cocktails and the food that it very much is like a combination of, um, you know, how to really create, recreate that feeling at, at home mm -hmm. by doing, making like the full experience with the cocktail and a drink. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question for you. So this eggplant parmigiano from Pantheon. Did they give you the recipe? Did you come back and make it multiple times? Like what I love about this is I feel like you got a B and B and like cook these recipes while you were in these towns and going to the marketplace, like talk to us a little bit about how you created the recipes sure. from the restaurants. So, so no, he did, well, yes, he gave me the recipe in that I bought his cookbook. <laughs> um, but that was after, um, you know, a lot of um, eating it, trying, cause it, it has a- Figuring a, it out. Yeah, like texturally, it, it all kind of melts together, which is something that I think is so crucial to make it luscious it is mm -hmm. eggplant i think can be so polarizing um and it's generally because it's undercooked and not delicious which i totally get i don't want to eat that either so no. um, this is um a really simple you know there's very few ingredients and um yeah i was i was chatting with sarah earlier they make a similar dish with zucchini where they'll like fry it really quickly and then layer it in between um in this case like uh i'm like mozzarella and I think some other stuff with lots of herbs and it turns into you know it's like a, a really um decadent gratin and I think um you know Italian Italian vegetables in particular unless you're getting a green salad is they are cooked like there is no uh -huh. there's no way beyond they're like, cooked, cooked. Cooked, cooked 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 like you cook not it, al dente no everything is cooked forever and it's kind of like it seems the it seems like it shouldn't be as delicious as it is, but then they also dump in like, you know, a quarter cup of like super fresh, gorgeous olive oil. So, um, yes. it's, um, yeah, it's, I love it. So, um, but I, this we, picture we, of it is at the restaurant, right? No, that's at my house. Oh, it is. We didn't well, shoot in Armando. It's actually not, um, that is one of the restaurants we did not shoot in. They the bowls um, look like they are totally from there. <laughs> I know. I wish. We did you put some in your bag? <laughs> we, no, I did not steal anything. That is, I don't steal anything. Um, as a, being a restaurant owner, I'm like, don't steal my stuff. But don't steal my pants. Yeah. Like, people do though. Oh my God. All the time. And they, there's some like um, strange liberty that people take that they think that it's like cute or something to take the spoon or the salt shaker or whatever. And it's just like don't don't you dare but yeah the like knives we had these really beautiful Loyola knives at Boat Street I had like 40 they're gone them. yeah I had two the rest have all been I mean I'm sure some of them went in the trash too accidentally but most of them went home with people so um <laughs> sidebar yes <laughs> um this is how we go we start we ran <laughs> back and forth um oh. we had one question about uh, do you share any restaurants or farmers markets in the cities featured? Absolutely. Yeah. So every place basically is kind of a download of what I could fit in the book 
right now of my favorite spots. So Rome, we talk about, there's a whole ch chapter on markets or chapter like story yes. on markets um, and kind of describing the difference between a lot of them. For sure, restaurants are all like featured, like Sarah was saying, there's a lot of photographs. Um, let me find some, like this is a really beautiful restaurant called Il Giochetto, which is um, uh, a wine bar not far from um, Campo de Fiori. And they were lovely. They, um, you know, and a lot of this, this is like so traditional Roman, like a pair TV um, yeah. with things that are preserved and, and, you know, like in their, in their pantry that they can put out. I mean, they have, you know, the only thing that's really fresh here is the mozzarella and the bread and everything else has been preserved in some way, which um, I think is a really um, great way to um, for sure start a dinner, but also just like that might be it like for me like i mean you can see i'm eating focaccia everyone that's probably my dinner um <laughs> and a yeah so that's been focaccia tell us about ben yeah so this is um also in the book it's a recipe that um our baker who's worked with us for a long time um he he's actually starting his own bakery now which is really exciting um but he um he also is a rome lover and we would talk on and on about all of our favorite rome um, you know, bits. And one of them obviously is focaccia because we have a restaurant and we wanted to serve like warm focaccia that we could get with like, you could get with anchovies and mozzarella and um, whatever else we have yeah. at the time. And he, <laughs> not that I asked him the right question, but I sort of figured he would tell me the trick, but um, I started, you know, like testing a bunch of recipes for focaccia, knowing about, you know, like knowing what I loved about his and um did it over and over and over again and I was like and I kept asking him, like I don't understand you know like mine is nowhere near what is your secret and he's just like oh he's like did I forget to tell you about milk powder and I'm like yeah you forgot to tell me about milk powder so immediately like that you know changed everything where it softens the dough and it makes it like really um pillowy and lovely and so so I figured I better call it Ben's Focaccia because it certainly wasn't mine because mine would have been shit compared to that so um yeah <laughs> yeah, so we serve this exact recipe um, in the restaurant at Wilmot's Ghost, and it's um, yeah, yeah, it's great. And so in the book, it's made to be in like a quarter sheet tray because it's um, a lot of people don't have small tins, so um, which is easy to. I actually posted a picture about it today on my Instagram. So yes, it's, um, it's about like the size of the book. Essentially, it's a little bit bigger than that when you um, get the pan, but um, it's just. It's really easy to make, like um, you can ferment it overnight if you want, but like today I didn't, I didn't do it last night. And so I made it early this morning and let it, um, let it rise in, on the, um, the stove and then put it in the pan and put it in the fridge until I got home this afternoon. And, and it goes in the oven a few hours later and yeah. you know, so it's a great relatively way Relatively easy to make. Yeah. Relatively. I mean, you know, if bread's never easy, but some is easier than others. So um, for sure. Yeah. And the but. Italians are really good at making simpler, more simple breads. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Speaking of Italian bakers. So I love the piece picture here that has the Rascioli yeah. bakery. So my first trip, I went to Italy to Rome. Uh, I stayed at a bed and breakfast right where Via Juvenari and Via Chiavari tea, which is right, yep. like right at that tea is where the restaurant is. And then the mark, the bakery is right there. And it's so delicious. And that family has been making bread and Roman style pizza forever. And their restaurant is near impossible to get into now. And they've expanded it. Um, but it's always on my like first stop when I get to Rome places. Um, yeah. it's, it's so good. Um, it has I've been known to bring some of the bread with me on the plane <laughs> and eat it when I get home. It's like my little secret that I... <laughs> that I do when I get home so that it's like if you're homesick from your travel get like a little pastry or a little something you can put in your bags so that when you land and you're tired you can have that final moment with mm -hmm. said ingredient or said dish I love that it's an amazing restaurant they um there's a you know in in Rome like one of the and we there's lots of pictures of it in the book but there's um uh, anchovies served everywhere and anchovies yes. are also served everywhere um which kind of feels a little contradictory because it's such an olive oil based food seems there. a little french right yeah um but it's it's very common and 
um, at Rochelle, they actually have like a sub menu of, of anchovies that you can decide which ones you want. Like, you know, they have like the different, like, um, the different, uh, pet, you know, like companies essentially the yeah. and like salted ones and oiled ones and some with like, Blind, yeah. Pickles. So I love that. Yeah. There's definitely like, they take their anchovies very seriously. So I I'm, hope that people that get the book and that are on the call, um, that, that like to cook at home, try to always have great quality anchovies because I really think it makes a huge difference. Um, I fell in love with the Cantabrian anchovies, one from Spain, and they actually do like a brown and a, and a white anchovy. And I'm telling you, like a great anchovy doesn't taste fishy or tastes like what people think an anchovy, like, ooh, I don't like anchovies because you get them at like a pizzeria and they're not that great. Like a great anchovy has like a totally complex layer of flavor, like an olive meets, you know, fish. I don't know. It's so good. So I loved all the anchovies that I saw, but I know that my mom would be like, oh my God, what do I do with all these anchovy recipes? But I sneak them in things all the time because they're such a great um, kind of base for flavor in dishes. And, uh, you know, it, it, it adds such like, I, you know, the umami or whatever you want to call it, but it definitely adds yeah. like complexity. Um, I always try to describe an anchovy as like the best tuna fish you've had. So it has that same kind of clean, meaty um, Briny. quality, but not, you know, it's definitely not like, so, you know, I have a good friend in San Francisco who um, uh, packs his own anchovies, but he does it for like a month a year. And I, he sent me um, a, like a little half pint container a few years ago for my birthday present. And, um, and they were like, harvested in the morning all all um broken down like filleted and and the guts removed and everything put into a brine and then packed in oil all like in a day essentially yeah and, um yeah and so it's just like tons of handwork and they're gorgeous and um that i think is unfortunately like the way you need to like find an anchovy because otherwise they are going to taste like something that got left on the dock for a yeah. day and then it got put in a truck and hauled somewhere and then eventually someone like <laughs> took the guts out and then they might have you know then I don't know like like it you get what you pay for with anchovies for sure and they're for you sure. know the the tins that like the, the crappy ones are probably a dollar 99 and the good ones are probably ten dollars um but yes. if you're gonna just eat them like the other ones you don't want to eat so it's worth it. And they're intense too. So you don't need, I mean, you can eat a ton of them, obviously, if you're a huge fan, but you don't need, you know, a whole tin yourself. You can definitely share that with friends. So I love that. Absolutely. Eat more um, anchovies. More anchovies. Let's talk a little bit about this beautiful steak, the fireplace cooked steak and Norman. the beef and Normandy and that beef you know, this is like why beef in Europe is so great. Like it's so lean, yep. but yet like so beefy and tender. But you talk like, is this beef, um, was this from the US, this producer? No, this is in France. So we were in this oh, guy's wow, cool. butchery shop. So um, many years ago, I, um, before I opened Walrus, I went to um, Normandy and ended up meeting um, a man named Stefan who was an oyster seller for a long time and and so we became friends and he started hauling me around because he I think thinks I'm crazy and um so we would go and to oyster so farms and, and yeah we would eat you know go to like Calvados producers he, you know I think normally I'm sure most people haven't been to Normandy um I think and when you do go to Normandy generally speaking most Americans go for the beaches they don't go for the cuisine or the right. um, other things that are that make Normandy really unique and special and so um, I think he, because he loves to eat food and loves, um, loves where he's from, I think, um, was, were, was thrilled to like have a bunch of people that want to show up and get hauled around to the best, like, you know, camembert producer and, you know, visit Vincent, the, yes. the butcher. And, um, he's actually the butcher and, um, farmer. Cause he realized that like raising cows, especially kind of as long as these are. So some of these are like six or 10 year old animals. Um, wow. Cause they're all grass fed, grass finished. So they're really slow growing. Um, and for them to get enough, you know, yield off of the cow, they have to wait for them to get big enough. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so we've, we, you know, we've been all over visiting Calvados producers and um, so yeah, it's, it's different. You know, Normandy is, is I think like, unlike all the other um, chapters in the book is the one that I've, I've eaten the most kind of um, cooked the most food at home when I'm there, you know, and then also um, in friends homes because there is like, a, obviously there's restaurants all over, but um, it tends to be, you know, kind of, I, you know, like I always have a hard time, you know, in all places I travel, but I think particularly in Normandy where the, the ingredients are so incredible. Like I want to go yeah. to this shop and buy that steak and cook it myself yes. versus going out to a restaurant, restaurant. And, and, and maybe not being able to even find that because it's such a, um, you know, decadent thing. So, so yeah, so this actually is a fireplace in a Airbnb that we rented and, um, I was wondering, it's, yeah. Looks Look at this. Does that not make you guys want to just plan your next trip to Normandy and rent an Airbnb and just pretend that you're from there? <laughs> it's like, it's a really spectacularly beautiful place. There's a picture of me in the beginning somewhere. The one and only. It's funny. There's only, I only have one picture of me um, somewhere, but I'm in, this is like in Normandy as well, like with the roses and everything behind me. So but yeah, we, the fireplace was um, not as big as many that I've seen, but like pretty, like there's a lot of old um, French fireplaces that I could walk into because um, wow. they're so giant. Um, but this was, um, we had a fireplace on either side of this house that was built, it was a timber timber frame house. So very traditional um, Norman style home. Um, there's another picture in the book of a building built that way. Um, I don't know what page, but um, they, um, we, we just decided to cook. And so this is just like wood that we found on the property and um, started the fire. And yeah. so a few pages before there's the um, shallots and the cider that was also. Oh, that's so there. beautiful. I uh, feel like Normandy has a real sense of flavor that's truly unique to itself. Like it, the, the ciders, of you've ever had the apple ciders from there, there's some that are pretty funky. Yeah. And so it's not your easy drinking cider, but I mean, incredible. And the cheeses, and I feel like there's a little bit of a funk happening with them. I don't know. Is that true? I mean, I think, yes, not, you know, there's, you can not in a bad that. way. And no. it's like amazingly cool. Like we're, 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 we're it their their ciders are like not as bitter and dry as like Basque ciders. There's definitely more fruit to them. Um, but yeah, they can definitely have kind of a, a farmy quality to them. But yeah, um, you know, it's it, you know, it's the one thing that I trust more than anything is is what other you know people that are from a place that tell me that this is how it's supposed to be eaten is is true. Mm -hmm. Like you know, like all of my like ideas around like pairing wines and blah 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 are complete crap when I go to a place like that because it's just like yeah. they've eaten this you know and drank these things for you know generations and they know you know I think it's a really important thing to like you were saying about having the cocktail that is from that place when you're there is because it starts the experience yeah and it's it's I think you're kind of selling your trip you're you know, day, your week, your month, whatever, if you're in this place short, because you're not, um, you're not paying attention to where you're at. So I love that. Like, you know, we had this delicious, um, barely sweet cider, which I would normally think like, I don't want to drink a sweet cider. Uh, here's um, the timber house. Timber house. Yeah. It's not beautiful. And so that's filled with barrels. Oh. With potatoes, I know. Um, but, um, yeah, like the, there's a, and somewhere in here another picture of this the camembert that we visited and oh, yeah with the prunes Oof. Well, that's a camembert made here in washington but um there's another one let me see those I prunes find. look so great those are crazy prunes so this is like in normandy uh. after we visited this farm um the big cow is from here too let's see if i can find her oh yeah i just saw her she's beautiful She's a, um, I, I should probably right here. I got her. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a normal. See, it is like a yearbook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She wins. Yeah. Prom queen right there. I love her. Yep. She's she, my favorite. 
She's a um, Norman cow, which is a breed of cow that is from that area that produces similar kind of um, high fat content as a Jersey cow, um, mm. but not as much milk. Um, and so um, because of, you know, production and people wanting to make money, um, they yeah, are like her udders aren't as big as like cows you see here in the States. Yeah. So she is, um, there's, I think this is the last farm that's entirely out of Norman cows, but he's trying really hard to bring that back because it's such a tradition to the area and the milk has such a, um, distinct, um, richness that, um, you know, it'd be a shame for something that's like from this place and really special that disappears because of cost, you know, like it's, right. it's hard to keep around. I think we need to- Or it disappears because it's too hard to, the demand is gone. So it's yeah. so hard to try to continue. Let's see, Absolutely. I see we have a few more questions. Uh, right. What motivated you to write this book and how did you choose the recipes? And oh, also yeah. out of curiosity, how did you choose the restaurants you eat at when you're abroad? Okay. But we all ask our chef friends where to go. <laughs> and then so, that's how we, we share. Uh, let's see, I'll start with the last question because that's more exciting to talk about. Um, the I spend a lot of time um, late at night on my computer reading about food in other places. So I, and then I think over time, especially since um, with Instagram, um, you end up with friends all over the world. And so you see where they're going and um, you just kind of keep track. I, I keep like a mental note of, you know, like where I'm going, or where I want to go. Um, although now I've decided that I need to start writing this down formally because my brain's starting to fail. Yes, but um, it's the um, exhaustion. Yeah. <laughs> the um, exhaustion. But I just, I just, look at a lot of things and then kind of see what other people are doing or loving. Um, I eat a lot, probably more than most while traveling. So like I pack in a lot of places in case one is, yeah, in case one <clears throat> I particularly find super awesome. I'm, I'm eager to follow it up with one that I love. Um, but just a lot of research. I don't really use books that much or like guidebooks or anything like that. Um, Mostly now it's just Instagram and like being nosy, um, asking yeah. people. Yeah. Instagram is huge. Like I yeah. always save, I always like tag, like save the little tags. Um, and so uh, they also want to know what's in your glass, Renee. What are oh, you drinking? I'm drinking. I asked about it. I, uh, I didn't forget to bring out the booze because normally I forget it. So. Um, so I made, um, which is essentially a, a, like spagliato, so a Negroni mm. without the gin, which is my favorite. Um, and these are, um, so Negroni normally is gin, vermouth, and some sort of bitter, normally Campari. This is um, Koki, which is um, um, to me a little um, more, not more bitter, I guess more bitter, less sweet, um, a little less like sharp. Um, and then this is kind of basically my new favorite vermouth in the world. It's called Molisano. It's from Torino, which is where, it's you beautiful. know, vermouth Mecca. Um, and it's, it's called red vermouth, but it's definitely dark brown or, you know, brown. Um, but it has really, um, kind of, uh, I'm not a super, like, I don't want it to taste too rooty or too like sharp, like like intense, like I wanted to kind of like all go together. So that is um, my favorite vermouth. And then um, instead of gin, it gets Prosecco. And my new favorite trick is little baby Prosecco so that I don't feel guilty. Yes, I not. agree. Cause then it just sits in the fridge and you're like. Yeah, and then you waste it. Although, you know, it stays sparkling for a while. It really does. One of my favorite producers, Adami, um, which is um, from Vado Biondine, which is the uh -huh. like kind of the crew area of Prosecco, if there is one. I don't know if they call it that, but. Um, I also like to pour leftover Prosecco on like sorbet and stuff like, like that little for free. like a quick like, little yeah. dessert if you have a little extra. So, so yeah, so that's what I'm drinking. And then I normally, like traditionally it's with orange, but I had limes or one sad lemon in my fridge. So I chose the sad lemon. <laughs> so there's a little like lemon cheek in here that that's is good loaded in there so 
Well, yeah. Also, Cindy said, I'm thinking so many people would love this book. My friend is retiring from teaching. She's ready for some adventures. Cindy, I couldn't agree more. I cannot yeah. wait to give this to all of my friends and family. So Renee, you're going to have to have a big shipment coming this way. Um, I'm drinking a little bit of the agave spirit with Ooh, some that. club soda and Meyer lemon. So let's talk Baja. Do you have time <laughs> right? to shift gears? And yeah. It's like the one semi rogue like location. And I want to know how did Baja come about? Um, Baja came about about six, seven. No, well, because of my first book. So I went, I was asked when you write a cookbook, cooks find any excuse to get to hang out with cooks um, and cook outside of their normal cooking routine because it's fun and it kind of breaks up kind of some of the insanity and um, so I was asked to go to Baja to cook um, for a weekend and I met Dano and Carla who are in the book um, they Dano is a bartender and he was managing the bar at the place where I was cooking at and um we just became super good friends and um i'm you, you know, have his negroni in the menu and the book do. there's a bunch there's two of his cocktails in there with there's, mezcal yeah yeah there's the barracuda which is with passion fruit and then the mezcal dano's negroni um yes that's dano that's dano he's the greatest can't wait i get to see him in a few weeks um, i want to go you should come i want to come dinner let's talk about that offline three weeks again if anyone wants to join us um but um seattle to baja on alaska is a four-hour flight and if you've been to seattle especially in the winter um you want to leave all the time um it's not like chicago winter like we're babies here we just get cold and damp and so a lot so of chicagoans leave um, yeah. <laughs> i feel like there's some of you on this call that do the old florida january yeah. to easter <laughs> love it so true it's, you it, gotta get out yeah it's hard it just you know february this, is usually when we would try to you know sneak away yeah well you know the the festivals kind of super kick up in january february right like the food and wine yep. festivals and things so normally i'm traveling several weeks um january february and this past year was like no travel and I was like wow Chicago really is sad because it gets dark at like 3 30 <laughs> in, in the afternoon it makes it so hard so yeah um, but so I yeah, hear you so going to Baja is is I mean I think I'm also like you know born and raised Pacific Northwest Pacific Ocean person and so yeah. there's this there were a kind of people that are um probably a little um you know, more laid back. And I, I think when going, you know, to Baja, like it's like the, it's the hot weather version of Seattle where people are like really interested in the outdoors, really interested in seafood and the um, environment. And, and it's very, um, it's very, uh, um, it's super rural too, where we go. We don't go to Cabo. Uh, we fly into Cabo and then drive north. So Todos Santos is where we normally end up or Cerritos, which is where Dano is. And um, it's about an hour, hour and 15 minutes north on the Pacific Ocean. And it's, um, you know, it's just, the food's fabulous. The people are wonderful. Um, it's warm. There's baby yeah. turtle. Like, I'm in heaven. Yeah. Well, man. this salsa matcha is one of my favorite salsas for like the crazy, amazing bitter notes. And I love that you have it in here. So yeah um, i'm definitely not originally from baja but um used all the time um with um you know in in like you know the restaurants and the areas around there from um you know like for example the clam dish in here is a dish that dano and um javier placencia at his wow. restaurant um, both have made and they have these big giant blood clams that you can get in los angeles too yeah scoop them out and chop them up and then fold in the matcha and then put them on the grill and matcha for those that don't know is um like a salsa um but made with dried chilies and um yeah, it's like a and peanuts and lime juice and um it's so good it has so much you want to put like it on different 
you yeah. want to put it on everything you have yeah. it and you're like where is the salsa been my whole life yeah I exactly. want it everywhere I did put it on three dishes in my cookbook. So there you go. <laughs> well, I made well, the matzo and it's on the tomatoes. And the yeah. Cup. Well, if you're going to make it, so like, that's the thing. Like as chefs, a lot of us have these kind of secret sauces that we make that we'll spend time on doing. And then that elevates the simple stuff that we can play around with. Right. So having those types of things in your arsenal are great. Yeah. Yeah. This is one and it keeps for a really long time. So you can you know, like any sort of um, dry, there's a salsa roja recipe in here too that I kid you not will last like a year in your fridge if you don't get through it. Um, I know that because I accidentally lost them in my fridge and yeah. <laughs> found it like a year later and tried it and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But it's just- yeah, I'm it, telling you stuff like yeah. lasts longer than people think it does. Absolutely. Uh, our, our omas are like green, our vinaigrette that we make with blended avocado, you would think it wouldn't last. The vinegar in it like totally pickles it's good for like six seven months like easy yeah so that's one thing that we learned at the james Beard boot camp was how misleading all the food labels are so everyone out there watching please don't just throw something away because the label says best buy so. yeah whatever yeah. sell by get rid of buy. all of that is even the part of there's like i don't i'm sure it's lost now in the the coffers of dc but there was a movement to try to like regulate the the the, the yeah. that sort of information on food because it's not mandated um in a way that like is consistent so you know there's the best buy the sell buy the pull buy but you know like you're by the end of it like a regular yeah. person like when i'm at home i'm like hell i don't know like is it good do i you know sniff it like you, you know like yeah, people it's, get just, scared. It's, it's hard yeah like no one wants to get sick but especially things that are you know, preserved or um, pickled or, you know, like in this case, like the chilies are already dried, like they're going to last for a really long time, which is awesome. Yeah. So one last thing, I could, we got to talk about your mom and dad. I feel like they're highlighted here <laughs> in the Seattle. I know. After. Sure. They're the best. Um, yeah. So the, your, my mom, is, are they from the um, Seattle area? I know. I love that picture. She's from North Carolina, actually. Um, ah. moved, kind of, um, yeah, moved to the to the Pacific Northwest as a 10 year old. Um, and um, my dad is from here. He was, um, gosh, now I'm gonna be in trouble. Uh, I think he was born in Spokane, but I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, grew up, he's from here. And so we, I've lived here my whole life. Um, spent a lot of time the picture of my mom in the book is at a place called Bibida, which is um a really gorgeous place the island opposite is called Kameno Island which my parents used to live on Kameno Island and then on the other yeah. side of that is Woodby Island which is a very kind of like famous island here um we have a lot of ferries in Seattle so they go to all these islands and there's ferries um I think there's I don't know there's a lot of ferries they go to Canada they go all over but um there's a lot of water, which makes it really gorgeous. And it's, I always like laugh when I get off the plane, when I'm coming home, we have the best air. Like it's like so clean and, you know, cause we have so many trees and um, oh. yeah. Um, oh, here, see my crow. There she is. She's even drawn. Oh. In the book. I love it. She's even in the book. The book oh. yeah. She's up in the tree right now, but um, that's our low too, drooling for fish. Um, yeah, the drawings, just to say a little bit more about that. So Jeffrey, I was saying- I right, love the illustration. It just captures the, the fun. Yeah. Story. So yeah, tell us about it. He, so he did the illustrations for the cover and then inside my book the last time, but most of it was just the cover. Um, and in this, I wanted, I really wanted there to be, um, he was my professor when I was at UW and I have been, you know, I just adore him. I think he's like, the, I always joke I, that he's the greatest human ever. Um, <laughs> which I'm sure like my parents and husband and all of them are like, what about us? But um, it's really Jeffrey, but he and I have been very close for a long time. And I think have a, um, we both kind of have a love for um, playfulness in art and that kind of like silliness almost that can exist. And so when I basically wrote like little um, vignettes for him for the, for the illustrations. And so I would say, 
you know, like in this case, like it's like me in my backyard with Arlo and the cat who's trying to get the fish and, um, you know, the crow and I know, and I grow these giant tomato plants. And so by the end of it, you end up with this this story in a drawing. Um, and then if you know Jeffrey at all, there's always these like little creatures that are tucked in um, as surprise. Um, so you're just constantly like, you know, there's like a bee and a tomato that's fallen and a grasshopper and um, they're just fun. You know, like I just, I think there's so much like kind of annoying bullshit around food and the seriousness. And for me, I just wanted this book to feel like I wanted it to be beautiful. I wanted it to be inspirational in like what people can like do easily at home and and just feel like, a, a, you know, to, for me, like my favorite way of um, traveling if I can't travel is through books and kind of seeing the eyes, seeing through the eyes of whoever lives in the place that they're writing about. So, so yeah, so Jeffrey does a really great job of, you know, turning that into a really sweet illustration. There's one more in here. Well, there's a lot, but there's one in London that is a drawing of um, this bar that I love called the Zetter Townhouse. And it was actually the hardest one to get to feel complete, but um, it's a big spread. And when you look at it up oh, close- Oh, I love that. Over here, there's this kitty cat who, if you go to the bar in London, you can order their deliciously tiny, but perfect martini um, that I really prefer. And there's a stuffed cat in the back corner and she's I always- see it. She's got a, well, normally she has a blue dress on, but at Christmas time, she has a Mrs. Claus dress on. But I just, you know, there, there's just fun things like that, that I think um, are really, you know, they're not, they're kind of ridiculous, but for me, they're like spots that I love in my, you know, travel and history of being somewhere. So yeah, right. looking at my crows. All I right, well, I am back, hello. Hello. I always pop up and like scare people. So I always try Hello. to go back. Thank you. Um, okay. So our time is almost up. We have about five minutes left. I think we got through all the questions actually. So a couple another nice comments. Cindy says, you know, that the diversity in places and recipes is the beauty of this book. Uh, Wendy shared that she's excited to use this book for get togethers with her friends. Mm -hmm. um they're starting to share meals and cocktails together again isn't that amazing so whoever Maybe. thought that that would be like something we'd be so like excited <laughs> to have back um so before we go i just wanted to actually ask both of you if you have anything new or exciting coming up that you wanted to talk about or tell us what's next well sarah's writing a book so we should talk about that that's kind of what i wanted to hear about <laughs> oh i'm in the still the the beginning stages it's slated to come out fall of next year and it's uh, all about vegetables but it's not a vegetarian book but I want to teach people how to think like the vegetable and find ways of bringing it into your cooking that can elevate vegetarian dishes meat focused dishes pasta dishes Do all you those say things think like the vegetable yes I love that <laughs> yeah the the book the title is title? think like the vegetable no, it's called Listen to Your Vegetables. Oh, okay. I like that. Yeah, so I feel like well, that's there's a lot. Awesome. Congrats. Thank you. There's a lot of things you can learn about them. So, mm -hmm. you know, put yourself in the zucchini shoes. It doesn't <laughs> want to just be the zoodles all the time. <laughs> I don't be that's so much more to give. doesn't want to be a zoodle. <laughs> I mean, it does, but not all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah, and then we're just, you, you know, Renee? Renee and I are just op trying to reopen our restaurants. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, gosh. How's that going for you guys? Hard. Good. Trying yeah. to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, really complicated, but spring helps. Spring and vaccines. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. Big fan Nicer of that. weather for outdoor seating again. I mean, here in Chicago, that was, that was a rough winter, I can imagine, Sarah. <laughs> um, you know, I sat in a lot of domes. So, which I'm actually going to kind of Good. miss the. I love it. Um, yeah, I'm just going to cook. I'm going to do the dinner in Baja in June, on June 14th. So if anyone needs a quick getaway to Baja and then uh, I'll be traveling for the book, hopefully this summer. So I'm going to eventually <laughs> um, 
you know, I'm going to hopefully go to the South, um, and do a big oyster festival and then up to new England and do another oyster thing and, um, make my way back. So it might be in Chicago. We'll see. I'm just starting to think about it. Cause it feels, you know, even like a month ago or I don't, yeah, I guess it's been like three weeks since the book's been out. Like even three weeks ago, I was not thinking that it was even possible. possible. So yeah. it's that, yeah. you know, that's, that's optimistic to me to imagine going somewhere and even if it's for me it's just I would rather have like half the people and still do something than you know miss all of that so it's just so fun to look at people and you know be in a room full of energy of of people excited about something so yeah are we going to schedule are we going to come cook in August yeah are you coming Let's celebrate the restaurant I don't to do anything big this year but you could come we could go out to Hama yeah. absolutely we were supposed to, last year was Walrus and the Carpenter's 10 year anniversary. And we had spent the whole year prior planning this big, oh. massive party. And yes, a huge party. Cancel it. It was going to be, it was going to be amazing. We were going to have like an old school Seattle grunge band play that was going to be rad. And we had all these, you know, chefs from all over. Sarah was coming from all over the country that had been like really um, important people to me that I'd met in the last probably I don't know, five or six years of being a chef. That's, it's funny. Like, I don't know, Sarah, if you agree with this, but um, my first probably 15 years of cooking, I was just so in the weeds all the time that I didn't travel. And, and our, our jobs changed a lot too, I think, but mm-hmm. um, you know, I did it. I wasn't exposed to a lot of people and I only worked for myself. I never, you know, came up through, you know, a group of restaurants. And so I didn't have this big network of um, people that I knew that would have, you know, so in the last five, you know, since my book, really, I traveled and met a lot of people. And, um, and so we were going to have this massive party, and we're going to do a dinner out at Hama and flying everyone in and, and then I'll, and I'll cancel it all. So, <laughs> but I, I know one of our again. stores had a big anniversary, and we had planned a huge party too. But yours sounds much cooler, if I'm being honest. It was, awesome. <laughs> was going to be really cool. I was very excited. We were having a lot of fun planning it. So, that but, is I hope you get to have it soon though. Like yeah. I know we're gonna have a 41st anniversary party and it's just sort of lame, but we're gonna go with it. No way. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to say um our time is coming to an end. So a thank you to everybody who came tonight and for your great questions. Um, thank you, of course, to Renee and Sarah. Thank you so much for doing this and being here tonight with us. Um I also, I forgot in my intro to mention the giveaway for the Alaska Airlines tickets. Um, Everybody who came tonight is entered into a drawing to um, win two tickets to Alaska Airlines anywhere that they fly. And there's a couple other events that they will be drawing um, names from for that prize. So you guys will hear, Renee thought maybe sometime in the next couple weeks um, that drawing will happen and you'll be contacted if you won that. There's also another giveaway they're doing for four tickets and that's over on their Instagram. If you go over to Alaska Airlines Instagram and you kind of scroll through their posts and you look for a picture of Renee, um, then there's instructions on how you can enter that as well. So I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that to you guys. Um, And other than that, again, thank you so much ladies and thank you to all of you who came. And, um, you know, I think we're almost out of this terrible time and I'm, I'm just hoping everyone stays safe out there so we can get to the light at the end of this tunnel. Yeah. Thank you very Goodbye, much. everyone. I love you. Love you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I, I love Cindy's comment about your crow. You should read that. It's amazing. It's oh yeah. Here, I won't shut off the event so you can still read it. Developing the, I'm going to take a picture of that. Well, I'll take a screenshot. It's so great. Oh. Life's magic. I totally agree. I've been like yes. so in love with the crow, which is kind of hysterical, but they okay. kind of scare me. That's interesting. All right, you got it. <laughs> All right. Yes, thank I'm you. Gonna, I'm going to shut off the event. Um, okay. My Everybody. boss needs the Zoom account in a minute. That's why she's pushing me off. Sorry, ladies. Um, I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much again. Bye. 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 Bye.